Russia is winning the war. What's your for you? No, I think that's a good assessment. I think they would always win to begin with. In a world where truth is often drowned out by a cacophony of misinformation, one man's unyielding pursuit of knowledge and the relentless campaign to silence him are an interesting story that really deserves our attention. That means that today you are in for a fascinating discussion with someone who has made waves in the world of international relations. I'm speaking about Professor Glenn Diesen, a Norwegian political scientist who has spent quite a number of years in Russia. Glenn has gained recognition for his lucid analysis of global events and he's a regular commentator on various news programs. But there's more. Glenn's journey has been marked by controversy and concerted attempts to discredit him. His detractors have tried to silence him by spreading false information and by casting doubts on his work. If you saw my interview with Dr. Daniele Ganser, then you know that Glenn is no exception and that speaking out can cost you your career. But despite these challenges, both men have remained committed to exploring the intricacies of global politics and they keep challenging conventional wisdom. So today we get a peek into Glenn's world. We are exploring his unique insights into international affairs and we will be hearing about the hurdles he has faced in the pursuit of open and informed discussions on international relations. So join me for a candid conversation with a political scientist and researcher who refuses to back down because he firmly believes that facts must remain facts no matter how inconvenient they are for the powers to be. Professor Glenn Deason. We had a very uncomplicated process. Basically, an hour ago, you confirmed for this interview, and here we are. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. How is it going in Norway? Yeah, things are pretty good here. Well, politically, not necessarily, uh, you know, but we have our problems here as well. But otherwise, yeah, all is fine. Yes, you're very close to Russia, which is actually the main topic of our discussion today. Yeah, we have a shared border up in the north. Uh, it's interesting, you would think that would create a lot more tensions, but in the north, we actually, the people in the north have a much better relationship with uh, Russia uh, than in the south, possibly because of the human exchanges, but uh, yeah. and different uh, history, of course. So. so you're a professor at the University of Southeast Norway, right? Yes, that's correct. And you're, you're teaching what? Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, political economy and uh, sociology. Yeah, and we just discussed you made your PhD on the Freie University in Amsterdam here in the Netherlands where I'm located. Yeah. Uh, you also speak Netherlands, I just confirmed, <laughs> yes. Well, very okay. little, but uh, yeah. And I saw you have a new book. I mean, I stopped counting by 11 or 12 books, something like that, right? But you have a new book, it's called The Ukrainian War and the Eurasian, the Eurasian World Order. And I saw also even John Mersheimer commented on it. Uh, yes, yes. Well, well, I got a lot of nice endorsements for the book. So uh, it was uh, John Mersheimer. I also got um, uh, Jack Matlock, who helped to negotiate the end of the Cold War yeah. on the American side, uh, Chas Freeman, and uh, yeah, a, f a few others. Yeah. And again, you have how many books? There's another one that stuck out to me. That's The Decay of the Western Civilization, right? But how many books did you write? Um, 11, 12? I don't know. Yeah, I lost, uh, I'm not quite sure now. I, uh, it's, it's, it's something along those 11 or 12. Okay. Uh, one thing uh, probably uh, worth mentioning is you're also a commentator. You are or you were a commentator on RT as a Russian Today, which has probably brought you a lot of critics, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I used to work in, in Moscow uh, as professor at the Higher School of Economics. And uh, when I was there, I used, used to go quite often to a studio to part of this political discussion program. Uh, among other foreign channels as well, but uh, and uh, when I relocated to Norway, I continued to write some op-eds, uh, but uh, yeah, that didn't go down very well because uh, here uh, any any Russian media is uh, denounced as uh, Russian propaganda, uh, which is uh, problematic because uh, I always said it shouldn't be controversial that uh, an academic uh, focusing on uh, Russian. Uh, Russian policy, Russian foreign policy, it shouldn't really be controversial that one speaks to the Russian media as well. But, you know, it's a bit of the political culture we have these days in which uh, 
uh, yeah, it's uh, people don't really listen to arguments anymore. They just want to know who did you talk to, where did you publish, uh, where did you travel. This is uh, <laughs> it's a new it's a new way of controlling academia, I guess. Yeah, and you're not the only one. Huh? I interviewed Noam Chomsky on that topic. I interviewed Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Ivan Kachanovsky. I don't know if you know him. He he wrote his PhD on what actually happened in 2014 on Maidan, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, Ukrainian Canadian. Uh, yeah, I've uh, had, exactly. uh, had a discussion with him before as well. Uh, very interesting yes. guy. Yes. So what I, what I like to do is I do, I do two things. First of all, I check out Wikipedia and then I check chat GBD, Yeah. So the more negative the reviews are on uh, Wikipedia, the more interested I'm in the people that I'm interviewing. Right? Yeah. Because Wikipedia, we know, is, is biased, uh, biased you know, from here to there. Yeah? Well, there's an approach to, to censoring academic these days. You have government funded uh, human rights organizations and, uh, you know, they have this human rights activist, but uh, their, their human rights, interest in human rights always seem to align with power interests. That is, you know, you're curious about or you want to condemn human rights adversaries. You want to restrict what your academics can say. And so uh, once I came back to Norway uh, about three years ago, uh, you had this... Uh, uh, yeah, a little group of uh, these people who began to publish uh, articles about me in the in the different media, and then with every publication that's out, you see them uh, also building a Wikipedia profile about me. And uh, once this is negative enough, I actually had a journalist in Al Jazeera who said that someone had uh, contacted them uh, to inform them about my Wikipedia page. You know, as a way of trying to cancel you <laughs> so it's, it's it's a quite uh yeah I, I i don't really care too much about wikipedia now it's uh it seems like it's a uh, yeah part of this uh, form formula they use to uh, try to smear your name so you end up in a situation where if any local media wants to do, talk to you then they can be shamed by referring to this wikipedia page otherwise uh yeah and then when you go to foreign media then you know they they condemn this as well so it's very difficult uh, <laughs> to be a uh, scholar in Russia these days, unless you're willing to just yeah. repeat what NATO is saying. Yeah, information control. But let's jump right into it with a little controversial topic. Russia is winning the war. What's here for you? No, I think that's uh, a, a good assessment. Uh, I think they would always win to begin with. Uh, the problem, I think, was when we said we were going to defeat Russia, we never actually defined what that means because Russia has defined NATO's incursion into Ukraine as an existential threat. You know, much like the United States would consider it an existential threat if China and Russia moved into Mexico. So anyways, uh, I never knew, learned what defeating Russia would mean. It, uh, I think we would have nuclear war before, you know, NATO would reach Crimea. But uh, yeah, I think Russia's winning now. Uh, I, I think there's been a lot of uh, wrong interpretations because uh, when Russia first went in, they they had a very much smaller force and their very clearly state objective, which coincided with their actions, was to force the Ukrainians to sign a favorable peace agreement or a political agreement f from the Russian perspective. Uh, but that never happened for a variety of reasons. So uh, what you saw one year ago was the Ukrainians going on uh, yeah, Google going on offensive first in you know, Kherson, uh, Kharkov, and uh, now later in the summer offensive to in Saporozhye. And uh, but over the past year, the Ukrainian exhausted a lot of their military equipment, their funds, their soldiers. Uh, meanwhile, the Russians were building up a huge force in the rear, so mobilizing hundreds of thousands of troops, building up a lot of equipment, ammunition, uh, drones, missiles uh, across the board. So. Now that the Ukrainians have largely exhausted themselves, you see this huge uh, Russian force being uh, starting to move forward. So, so again, it's a war of attrition when you want to exhaust the adversary. I think people focus too much on territory, but you know, in a war of attrition, the territory is usually taken after the adversary is exhausted, because you don't want to spend deplete too many of your troops and resources on the well fortified uh, defensive lines. So, but at the moment, uh, if you just look at the numbers in terms of attrition rate, like who's losing more, uh, who has more artillery, who has more drones, who has more missiles, who has better electronic warfare equipment, uh, every measurable indicator suggests that uh, Russia enjoys a huge 
advantage uh, much greater. And all of this is happening now at a time than uh, the U.S. seemingly, you know, losing its interest in this war. So uh, everything is going wrong for Ukraine now. And even, you know, Western media is now recognizing this, which was denounced only a few months ago as Russian propaganda. But uh, now it's also come come around. So it, it, it doesn't look great for Ukraine. So in a situation like this, you would assume that negotiations would begin, of course. Yeah, unless there are powerful interests of this uh, preventing that from happening. Yeah. But the overall, uh, let's say, message that was sent out initially and uh, up until recently, yeah, that uh, uh, Putin kind of, you know, invaded Ukraine unprovoked. There was no context. Yeah, It's a bit like comparing what happened on October 7, you know, like the initial, you know, problem disregarding 75 years of occupation, right? So it's a well versed practice of focusing on the what, but not on the why. Right. So if we take, if we go back to um, 2014, at least to 2014, I mean, I spoke with Noam Chomsky, as I said, Noam Chomsky and, and Jeffrey Sachsen about this, yeah, because many commentators, Western commentators, that disregard the importance or the criticality of the uh, NATO expansion for Russia. Nevertheless, William Burns in his uh, autobiography wrote that the expansion of NATO is the reddest of red lines. So what are you uh, replying to those who say, well, first of all, Russia's invasion to, to Ukraine was unprovoked and NATO expansion had nothing to do with it? Well, I, th I think it's dishonest and it's clearly a lie because uh, we keep now saying, oh, Russia's saying this, they don't actually believe it. But but uh, it, it's dishonest because you can actually track all the Western uh Western leading, leading uh, military political uh, experts who has been saying this for now 30 years, that this would cause a, a problem. Keep in mind that even in, in January of 94, even then President Bill Clinton recognized that, you know, if we do decide to expand NATO, it will has the risk of redividing the East with the West. And, you know, you had the, you know, the foreign, uh, the, uh, the ambassador, American ambassador to uh, to Russia in the early 90s, also saying that this is the one thing that's uniting all Russians. This is considered uh, to cancel the the peace after the Cold War. And uh, you know, you had you know Jack Matlock who negotiated an end to the Cold War, said that this was a stab in the back. This would cancel the peace. George Kennan, you know, he was the architect behind the containment policy. He lived until in, into the 2000s, uh, I think 2008 or so. And he, yeah, he, he also was very critical. He said, you know, this was no point. This will restart a Cold War. And when the Cold War begin again and Russia finally starts to hit back, we're going to pretend as if, you know, this was unprovoked or he didn't use to unprovoke, but just, just the way the Russians are. That's what he, he said. So, and of course, yeah, Madeleine, uh, Albright, even the people who are for expanding, uh, recognized that the Russians were fiercely against this. And uh, if, if if you want to ask why they still did it, you can go to uh, the defense minister of uh, Bill Clinton, who made it very clear, he's given interviews, because uh, he was very critical of NATO expansion as well. And what's more interesting, he pointed out that the, the people in the Clinton administration, they didn't uh, reject his arguments that this would destroy the peace with Russia, but instead... His argument was they, they simply didn't care. They said, well, who, who cares? Uh, Russia's weak. It's getting weaker by the day. We don't have to listen to them anymore. If they, if they think this is a threat to the security, again, who cares? Uh, they will have to adjust because this is the new world. So we've been going on like this for 30 years now. Uh, the people are for and against NATO expansion all uh, recognize that this was uh, seen as a threat to Russia. Uh, even in the 90s, when they had the debates whether or not in the Senate, if they should expand NATO, uh, I would advise everyone to look through these files uh, because they keep uh, using the word insurance policy. Like, you know, if, if, if we have a conflict with Russia in the future, at least then we'll have NATO expanded all along the Russian borders. Now we'll have a huge NATO and Russia's isolated. So it doesn't matter anymore if we'll have a conflict because now we have an advantage against them. So obviously this was directed against Russia. and But now... As uh, George uh, Kennan said or warned, once we have this conflict, we're going to say, no, no, this is just the way Russians are. They're just expansionist imperialists. This is uh, nothing to do with NATO. But again, this was, uh, it's, 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 it's false. And uh, even if we don't believe that NATO expansion is a threat to Russia, there can't be any doubt at all that Russia sees it as an existential threat. Everyone in Russia agrees on this. And uh, they will act accordingly. So to say that this was unprovoked, I think is uh, is very dangerous because we delude ourselves, and you know, bad analysis tend to lead to very bad policies. 
it's also disregarding completely what happened since 2014. I mean, there were, what, what 15,000 dead Russians since 2014, yeah, uh, killed by Ukraine, right? Basically by their own government because they were in Ukraine uh, uh, territory. But I mean, I think the, the, the geostrategic nightmare of the US in particular is, of course, uh, German know-how and money combined with Russian resources, right? And the first NATO general... General Secretary Lord Ismay stated already that the that the formal purpose, you know, of NATO is to keep uh, America in, Germany out, and Russia down. And there are there's a site I believe it's called Lord Ismay Restated or something. So you can see a whole list of American or Western politicians repeating that uh, the doctrine in regards to you know expansion of of Western infrastructure. And one thing that people forget is NATO. Countries means for Russia one thing, NATO nuclear weapons in that country. So if I say, let's compare with the Cuba crisis, what would be your comments? Well, I think it's very much comparable because, uh, you know, we, we, we keep saying, no, 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 but uh, Ukraine must have the right to choose uh, which alliance he wants to join. Uh, but but this is not a real principle. We don't actually believe in this. Uh, well, when, if, uh, the, if the Russians begin to place their missiles back in Cuba, if the Chinese want to build military bases in Mexico, will we really still suggest that this right to join military alliances is this sacred principle? Uh, you know, I, I, I think not. Uh, again, there's many people in the United States now who would who suggest that, uh, you know, they should intervene in military because of the, the crisis with the cartels and all. Now, so, you know, Mexico has, if it wants security, you know, it can invite foreign powers. But uh, this is, no one would help Mexico to do this because, you know, the Americans would bomb this country to the ground before that was ever done. So, uh, so this idea that this is some sacred principle that, uh, uh, that you know, the, the way to peace is effectively just to let NATO expand and uh, no one should, Russia should have nothing to say. It is it's never a, a serious uh, proposition. And I think that by, by ignoring the security concern of a of a, a key rival uh, or opponent, uh, I think we ended up undermining our own security. If we focus on the consequences for a moment, right? I mean, there are two things that I would like to uh, roll by you. How how well are you informed in regards to the Nord Stream attacks? Uh, well, I've been following it uh, uh, quite well. Uh, but I, uh, I I agree with I would also put uh, like you're suggesting the Nord Streaming this wider context of, uh, of uh, you know British and American policy because if you ask any British historian or a political scientist what has been the policy of Britain Britain over the past centuries has been always to ensure divisions because they're the dominant maritime power so make sure the European land powers do not start to converge you know this is something they learned from the uh, Napoleon's continental system this is. Uh, fear that always lingered ever since now and of course it's correct this is why a huge industrial power of germany rising and connecting with russia that this would shift the entire power away so you will always want to have divisions between these two countries that was a key goal by the british and then when the americans took over dominance it became an objective of the of the americans because when they come together they can form an alternative pole of power if you keep them divided the Germans will be dependent on the United States, while the Russians will be weakened as an adversary. So, you know, this is why you divide divide the large countries to create dependent allies and weakened adversaries. And I think uh, Nord Stream obviously fit uh, quite obviously in this category. You know, they threatened over and over again uh, for a long time uh, about that they would attack Nord Stream. Um, that this was a dangerous it would uh, you know would make uh, germany dependent on on russia they even sanctioned european companies who who were working on the nord stream to to help us to protect us from ourselves and you know and uh, once the uh, we'd start nearing a conflict or uh, before the russian invasion uh, the americans you know biden everyone made it very clear if uh, if there's ever an attack you know we'll destroy it victoria newland joe biden everyone was saying this then it was attacked, and then you have people like Anthony Blinken saying, "Oh, what a wonderful opportunity! Now we can finally cut all European dependence on on uh, Russian gas." So it's um, you know it's uh, they, they they try to blame the Russians, of course, from from day one, saying, "Oh, it would have been the Russian," but then you had the Seymour Hersh article come out 
and suddenly is blaming you know the United States, and they also said the Norwegians were assisting. And then uh, suddenly, almost overnight, the Americans start to say, "Well, actually, uh, no, it's not a us, sailboat, but it was a sailboat." Yeah, it was a sailboat with the Ukrainians. So they're trying to blame now the Ukrainians. So even the Americans are now saying it wasn't the Russians, but it was the Ukrainians. Uh, and again, this is. Um, I have seen the sailboat story. It doesn't have, have much credibility. And you know, even if it was the Ukrainians, it couldn't have happened without the knowledge or support of the United States. Uh, it's simply it, it wouldn't happen, not in the Baltic Sea. So it's a it's a it's a bunch of nonsense. But also the Americans are now claiming they knew even before the Ukrainians allegedly uh, allegedly attacked the Nord Stream pipelines that this would happen and they warned against it. So why, but after the, it blew up, the Americans went directly and blamed the Russians. Now, why, why would they lie to their own public and the entire world that it was the Russians when they now even admit they knew about the attack before it actually happened? So, so they've been lying all, uh, all along. So, uh, but again, I don't have any evidence that the, the Americans did it, but, uh, but at the moment, I, I, can't, I haven't heard a single credible alternative alternative hypothesis. So who else could it be? If it wasn't the Russians, are really buying it? That was the Ukrainians who did it without the assistance of the Americans, without their knowledge. I just, I, I can't see, you know, how this sailboat story mm. makes any sense at all. Simply follow the money. Yeah. Who has the largest benefits? Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Now Europe... Now Europe is in deep, deep trouble now because... You know, we made it sound like uh, buying Russian gas and doing the Russians a favor. This was cheap, reliable supply of gas. This is, uh, by definition, energy security. Now all the energy intensive industries will go bankrupt, will deindustrialize. And of course, uh, for the Americans, not so bad because now Europeans have to pay more for American gas. So they make lots of money. Then our businesses, uh, industries are no longer competitive. So they will move across the Atlantic to the United States. So it's uh it's not a bad deal for the Americans, but uh, I always said I feel bad for the German journalists and politicians who have to stand there in front of the camera and uh, yeah we don't know what happened uh, you know they're not allowed to discuss it almost because uh, they can't blame the Americans but who else would they blame so they end up not talking about it. By the way, there's also an article in Washington Post when they said that after talking with different Europeans there was a, an agreement uh, across the West now let's not talk about. Nord Stream anymore because it can only lead to uncomfortable answers. So <laughs> this is where we are. Uh, it's uh... yeah. If if it would turn out that one NATO country attacked the critical infrastructure of another NATO country, right? What would that mean about the NATO contract itself? Because the NATO contract was set up, you know, uh, against threats from outside. But suddenly you have a threat from within. From within, what what would that mean for NATO itself? Yeah, it's not a, it's 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 not a small little topic that we can kind of conveniently uh, disregard, right? Yeah. This, will not, this will not go away. And what if it was, uh, le le let's for argument's sake, let's say the Americans are correct. They didn't do it. It was the Ukrainians. Well, now Ukraine has attacked NATO. Is, is that what we're saying? Well, of course, they, they tried to get around it, saying that, well, no, no, it wasn't the Ukrainian government. It was some rogue elements in Ukraine. So suddenly it's not even a state actor. It's just some random Ukrainians without any connections to the government who are on a sailboat, you know, <laughs> blowing up critical infrastructure. So it's quite absurd. And also it, it is quite transparently absurd because, you know, the Russians uh, called for a, an, an independent or uh, investigation yeah. into this, you know, in which you know the Russians and the NATO countries wouldn't be the ones con conducting this investigation, but you would have, uh, you know, from some non-aligned countries. And, you know, the, the Western countries, uh, you know, voted no. Uh, we don't want any investigation independent we we will do it and eventually we will tell everyone else what happened this is uh, you know which doesn't really uh, give uh, a lot of reason for confidence and yeah. trust yeah. there were actually uh, investigations i know for sure from norway from sweden i believe from denmark and of course from germany right and they all have been classified yeah yeah they all have been classified even within those countries yeah because i believe germany requested the information from Denmark, I believe it was, or from Norway, and it was rejected. Yeah, these kind of things. So there is definitely some some information out there that is being deemed very sensitive. Okay, but coming from the actual act, 
to the consequences because it's way larger than just focusing on Germany, right? It has it, and you mentioned the keyword already: the is the industrialization, right? And it's not only about Germany. So if we, if we look at this, and then again, of course, a big advantage for for America to to weaken a main competitor in the global market, right? But what does deindustrialization actually mean? I mean, it's a it's an abstract concept that many people have in the back of their minds. But what does it actually mean? To deindustrialize. Uh, well, uh, Europe is no longer competitive, and uh, and this is a very very problematic because uh, you know I industries were already changing. Uh, we're already shifting with. Uh, you know, new digital giants, uh, you know, starting to take over a lot of traditional production. And, and uh, you know, that's the direction of the economy. Europe already has a lot of problems because we don't have, even, we don't have our own digital ecosystems like the Americans or Chinese or Russians. Uh, so this was already a problem. But, uh, you know, what, what has really made Europe move forward has been uh, the German uh, export, uh, well, industries, because it has an export-based economy. Uh, you you export more than imports and you build up all these uh, funds and of course within germany uh, with their with their industries a lot of the europeans are of course also relying on uh, connecting into these supply chains so well what 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 uh, what happens if uh, if you don't have access to energy anymore cheap energy again energy is really the lifeblood of an industry if you have cheap energy you can have a competitive advantage you can produce more this is why the Germans were always careful. That's why they built the Nord Stream 1. That's why they asked to have the Nord Stream 2. Again, this wasn't forced by the Russians. This was something the Germans asked for, something they wanted, uh, exactly because their industries would be more competitive. But now, of course, this is uh, they're, they're cut off this energy and uh, their, their, their products can't really compete anymore in prices. So they're shutting down uh, different industries. Uh, uh, and again, not just in Germany, but you see it in France as well. This is becoming a huge, a huge threat. And uh, I think it was the economic minister of France who, who in the beginning after the Russians invaded, said, "Oh, we're going to, uh, you know, run the co Russian economy to the ground. We're going to destroy the Russian economy." And uh, he tried to walk a little bit back later on because it was a bit too well warlike. Uh, but uh, then, now of course, a few months ago, he made the observation that oh the actually the americans are deindustrializing us because just at this moment where we have to pay more money for energy which makes which uh, makes our industries non competitive is which is why they're moving across to the united states uh, the united states has this uh, uh, inflation reduction act <laughs> in which they provide incentives actually for a lot of industries as well so it's um it's uh, it's something that is really uh, yeah creating a huge uh, problem for for all of Europe now. So mm. I, don't, I don't really see a path how to recover from this either, because uh, what's really neglected from this is Russia has used this as an opportunity to move on. Uh, they're not looking for the sanctions to end and then simply reconnect with Europe. They have undergone a huge shift. They are shifting their economic connectivity from West to the East. So, East, so this is not. China. So we're not going to recover from this. This is uh, yeah. this is a huge mistake, and we're not discussing it really. Yeah. So before we come to Russia, I have one one last question in regards to Europe. Yeah. Why I try to figure out why are European leaders so eager to sacrifice Europe on the altar of U.S. hegemony? I do not understand. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure either, to be honest. I think. Uh, I think when it was proposed, uh, I think we've been pulled along this Ukrainian path for so long. Again, if you go back to 2008, the Europeans were quite vocal about it. Uh, the reason why, you know, the Germans and French didn't want to offer a membership action plan to Ukraine then was, you know, in uh, Angela Merkel's word, it would be a declaration of war against Russia. It would be interpreted as such. So, yeah, so much for non provocation. Mm -hmm. uh, but, anyways, uh, I think that uh, we, we followed the Americans uh, for so long on this because also after 2015, when they very openly began to ignore the, the Minsk agreement for peace and instead just supplying weapons, the kind of the Europeans went along. The Americans were saying, listen, we'll just build up the, build up the military capabilities of Ukraine and then. Russia will start to back off and, uh, you know, that peace agreement in Minsk will, uh, you know, we will be able to renegotiate it. So, so again, gradually the Europeans go along and then 
uh, once uh, Russia finally gave up and invaded in uh, 2022, uh, the Americans as well, they sold this to the Europeans as, listen, well, we will supply all the weapons to the Ukrainians. You can't beat the United States of America and collective NATO. And also we're going to put to this uh, detrimental sanctions, you know, we collapse their economy and their currency before the end of the week. And, uh, you know, a lot of the Europeans bought into this and, uh, you know, so step after step, we, we've been sucked into this for too long now. There's no, there's no off ramp. Uh, when are we going to reverse course? There's no, there's no good chance. So I think it's just, uh, again, this expression when, when you're in a hole, you should really stop digging. And I think that's what we should have done. And instead, with every sanction that doesn't work, which hurt us more than the Russians, we keep doing more sanctions. And uh, I think also a key weakness behind this is there's no debates anymore. Because I, you know, whenever I heard people try to explain why the sanctions are actually hurting us more than the Russians, we shouldn't do this. You know, they're called Putinist, uh, you know, apologists. They don't care about Ukraine. You know, if they really cared about Ukraine, they would just send weapons uh, no matter what. So it's, um, it's, um, yeah, this is the price I think we're paying for all this, you know, censorship, absence of debate, and of course, blindly following the Americans. And we are seeing a a change in politician, but also in political behavior. Yeah, because you mentioned Minsk, Minsk one, Minsk two. We know from both from Angela Merkel and from President Hollande, there was just a trick. They openly stated on camera that the Minsk agreements were only there to give Ukraine the time to be trained and to arm them to fight uh, to fight Russia. So that was, you know, yeah. This was uh, Merkel, Holland, yeah, Poroshenko said it, Zelensky. So uh, across the board, everyone said it. Uh, but uh, uh, but of course, the British and Americans from day one, they were very vocal about this. Uh, you know, the John McCain, them, they called uh, the Minsk Agreement for Moscow bullshit. That was uh, their their term. So, uh, uh, well, I, actually, another reason I think might be the entire ideology that's been driving the West since the end of the Cold War. Because when the Cold War came to an end, uh, the United States kind of pitched this uh, liberal hegemony idea, which was, you know, from now on, there will only be one center of power, which will be the United States. Everyone will align under the U.S. This will create peace, stability. And of course, since the Second World War, the Americans have been able to provide some peace in Europe. So the idea was to expand this globally. And this was a very appealing proposal for the Europeans. And uh, so kind of, I think we have a whole generation of politicians now who bought into this, that uh, you know, under American leadership, the whole world will become gradually more liberal, more democratic. Uh, and, you know, it's the promise of perpetual peace. The whole Kantian idea, this was, uh, I think, very ad attractive. So to suddenly now, uh, and I think that's what uh, the Ukraine war to a large part represents as well. This was, uh, you know, this the manifestation of this was NATO expansion, putting the all of Europe under uh, U.S. leadership. And, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, w walking this back means we have to challenge... Uh, the last 30 years of policies that this somehow was a uh, that this wasn't a good idea so i think it's very difficult and uh, you can't do it with the current political class i think the existing one will be will cast away uh, as their policies fail and i think from slovakia netherlands uh, well hungary across the board i think you will see the new new politicians coming in to place with different ideas who might be in better position to challenge this uh, this consensus uh, of a liberal hegemony yeah, because you say Holland. Yeah, here we we just had a kind of uh, earthquake in in uh, in political terms. Yeah, uh, uh, the right wing party is now the largest party here. They didn't form a government yet, as far as I know. But Kjell Wilders has, I think, thirty five or thirty seven seats from one hundred fifty. It was still when I, I last time I lived in the yeah. Netherlands was in two thousand ten. I remember then Kjell Wilders was presented as some uh, peripheral uh, figure, so almost like a joke. Uh, you know, not nothing serious yeah. and. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not. Uh, yeah, it's been... yeah, he he joins the ranks. Uh, um, Le, Le Pen in France, in Frankreich, and of course in Italy, right? So those populists are on the rise. But if we have a look at uh, Russia, the failing of the Western sanctions. So that was again misinformation. Yeah, they, they, you said it already. They, they they presented it like in a week from now. You know, when uh, the, the your Russian uh, economy will have collapsed, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, that didn't, that didn't happen. Instead, you know, there is BRICS is growing. BRICS is growing with Saudi Arabia and 17 other, other countries on their potential member list. But 
um, Saudi Arabia will already join in January, like in a month from now. Right? Yeah, no. So, so, well, it's a way of reorganizing the international economic system because uh, uh, everything, again, after Cold War, was organized around uh, the collective West with the US at the center. So, uh, so this is, uh, you know, the world's been using American technologies, they're relying on US companies, industries. Everyone's using the transportation corridors, the maritime routes, which are under the control of the U.S. Navy. Uh, you know, we're using the U.S. dollar. We're using American-led uh, development banks. Uh, you know, we're using the SWIFT payment system of the Americans. We're using Western insurances. Like, everything has been built up around the West. And um, I guess uh, what really began to happen a decade ago was the Chinese coming forward and beginning to challenge some of this. You know, they're saying, hey, we have our own... Uh, you know, the China 2025, our own, you know, technological or industrial policy in which they want to take leadership in key industries. They want to, you know, have their Belt and Road Initiative for a new transportation corridor. They want to develop their own national uh, well, development banks. Uh, they want to start to trade in their own currency. They, instead of SWIFT, they, they developed the uh, SIPS, which is the Chinese version. And then, of course, uh, uh, the, the Russians began to do the same. They also have, you know, focused on technological sovereignty in, in the digital sphere. Uh, you know, developing the more more independence from Western supply chains. They're also developing these transportation corridors. You know, through the Arctic, through the Eurasian landmass. They're also developing their own development banks. Uh, all of this. So I guess, um, uh, and also now, stop using both the dollar and the euro. So, but of course, you need international institutions to facilitate this new economic infrastructure. And, you know, you have some different ones coming along. Uh, the BRICS, from, from my perspective, is really the most potent one. Uh, of course, you have the Shanghai, Shanghai Corporation Organization, uh, which, is, uh, which also has a lot of potential. Then you have the more Russia-led Eurasian Economic Union, which can still form, uh, you know, free trade agreements and others with, uh, you know, outside the former Soviet Union. But nonetheless, uh, I think uh, the BRICS is really the one to keep an eye on because... Uh, they're really going for um, a huge part of the world population where you find the world's natural resources and uh, yeah, a huge part of the now, yeah, the biggest uh, economic block, they passed the G7 already. So it's, um, uh, it's a new way of organizing the world economy. It's not a, it's not an alliance uh, in, in the, in the, in, in the traditional sense, but it, it is an alternative way of organizing the world economy. So we, the West, we have about 16, 16% of the world population. BRICS is, I believe, 56% of the world population. Yes. Right? So, so, so uh, you know, it was, it was bound to happen at some point, which is uh, that, the, you know, the, the reality is it's no longer a unipolar system. Uh, it's already multipolar. But uh, the, the problem is we, we, we still hold, we're still between the unipolar system, which the world econ economy and military was built up around the U.S., and the multipolar system where you have new centers of power. The thing is, we're, we're in a transition period, and the, the Americans, of course, are trying to pull back towards the unipolar unipolarity, while uh, the Russians, Chinese, and others are going for multipolarity. The, the problem is that uh, most of the world is more sympathetic to the multipolar. Even countries who would like close relations with the U.S., like the Indians, the Saudis, they, they don't want to join an alliance against the Americans, but they also they don't want this hegemonic system anymore. They want to have several centers of power, which allow them to, you know, uh, diversify their economic connectivity so the U.S. can't put this pressure on them. And, um, yeah, I think that's also been a, it's intensified under sanctions. One, because of necessity, because the Russians can't, you know, use the economic infrastructure controlled by the U.S., but also the rest of the world. You know, when are we going to seize their funds? When are we going to take their assets exactly. uh, when are we going to cut them off from the dollar and our banks uh, you don't even have to do anything wrong you can merely be secondary sanctions so you know countries will seek self preservation that means uh, diversification then you know institutions such as brics are quite important yeah and it's not the first that it's not the first time that america is doing that so they confisc confiscated what was it 600 billion from afghanistan they confiscated i nobody knows how much from iraq of course right yeah. And now they are actively discussing confiscating Russian assets in order to fund or finance Ukraine, right? They did similar things in Venezuela. 
you know, just announce, oh, True. by the way, we don't recognize their president. Uh, let's do Juan Guaido. Uh, let's, let's recognize him as president and then give him control over assets. Uh, it's the British, if I'm not wrong, they seized their gold reserves. I mean, it's just uh, the, 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 the trust in the system is disappearing. And, uh, you know, that's what the, the G7 are discussing now. Hey, shall we, s- the money we froze from the Russians, the asset, should we just take it and we can use it to support Ukraine? I mean, this is where we're at uh, again. And I think that there's a split because when you hear the G7 politicians talking, they they speak as if this would be the the pinnacle of virtue. Like, look how good we are. We're taking from the bad invaders and giving it to the victim. But of course, this is not how the rest of the world sees it. They're, you know, they're, they're shocked and appalled. I mean, imagine if the whole world would start to seize American assets and give it to Iraq because of that invasion. Or, you know, take, uh, you know, African countries will start to seize assets from NATO countries and give it to Libya. It's absurd. It's uh, the the trust would be gone. Uh, You know, it doesn't mean that, uh, uh, you know, Russia hasn't done anything wrong in Ukraine, that, you know, Ukraine, you can argue that they they deserve some uh, reparations from uh, Russia. Yeah, you can make that argument, of course. There's nothing wrong with that. But the way this is being done now trying to develop legal mechanisms for theft, it's just... uh, uh, again, we, we're at a point where if you if you don't support it, they they denounce you as Putinist, and uh, you know they will try to again <laughs> build your Wikipedia page to make you sound like a horrible traitor. But the thing is, this is not good for us. Uh, who, who will trust us again? Who will trust our banks? Who will trust our mm. uh, you know transportation corridors? You know, you can't. It goes across all the different aspects of economic connectivity. We did the same with the Chinese. We're c- cutting off their access to technologies. We, you know, seizing uh, Iranian tankers uh, along the maritime corridors, cutting off people of payment system, cutting them off insurances, uh, access to banks. I mean, across the like, this is the world is seeing this. They're not feeling any trust, and when there's no trust, people will again diversify. So I think we are doing huge damage to ourselves. But again, there's no discussions. It's just the, you know, the, the virtuous class who are willing to go all in. And then you have the traitors who are suggesting that, wait a second, maybe we should uh, think uh, how this might backfire. So it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, we, it's a very dangerous and yeah, sad position to be in. You discussed the Eurasian world order in your book, The Ukraine War, yeah? So from that book, what would be the most, the, the three, the top three or top five, let's say, most controversial topics that you brought up? Well, it wouldn't really be that that controversial. I mean, uh, the, the, the foundation for... Yeah, not, not for you, maybe, oh, yeah. not for you, really, <laughs> maybe, but, but, but for, for your critics, probably. Yeah, well, yeah. well, the foundation of the modern world order, you know, after the collapse of the uh, Holy Roman Empire was... Uh, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. This is when we created the foundation of the modern world order, which is uh, based on two key principles, which is uh, the is, uh, sovereign equality, so sovereignty of the state, and uh, peace will be ensured through a balance of power. You won't have one dominant state, but you'll have many, and they will balance each other, so no country will be able to dictate to the whole world. Now, after the Cold War, we abandoned this. We said, no, actually, we'll go for Pax Americana or we'll, we'll go for a hegemonic system. That meant two things. First, you denounce the principle of balance of power because now there's only one superpower and no one can balance it. Uh, again, this was in the security documents, uh, strategic documents of the US. And second, you can't have uh, sovereign equality anymore because if you're going to be the hegemon, why would you accept the same constraints on yourself than the others? So what the West and the United States did begin to come up with new rules of international law, or we call it rules-based international order, in which there's sovereign inequality. So we say, listen, we can intervene in the domestic affairs of other countries. You know, we can promote democracy, we can uh, support human rights, you know, we can use military force if we have to, uh, you know, we can topple governments because it's, you know, democratic revolutions, we call it. So you have all these ways where we don't have to respect the sovereignty of other states, but they have to respect our sovereignty. So we create this system, uh, and this is this goes completely against uh, the Peace of Westphalia, which is the foundation of the world modern world order. What I'm saying is that the countries like Russia, China, what they want to establish is a renewed Westphalia. So it's not alien to us, but uh, it's not like the old system because old Westphalia was sovereign equality for the Europeans. Uh, back in those days, we again we, we colonized the rest of the world, so it wasn't complete. But now 
complete sovereign equality. But this time, uh, what the Chinese and Russians are uh, seeking is now, uh, yeah, a system of, uh, of, of multipolarity, and uh, and then also then it would have to be based on the idea of having equal sovereignty. So I think for this reason you will see a lot of norms of universalism will go away, because once you say that something is universal, then you can undermine the sovereignty of other states. So the Chinese, for example, they have these projects for a global civilization initiative. When they say, and the Russians are, you know, saying the same thing, which all civilizations have are distinctive; they're different. We will develop at, if, along our own path, uh, you know, abiding by our own cultural norms. So, in other words, that's what you want to say if you reject the interference of any other countries. So. Uh, so I think this is the main shift that's uh, that, that that's taking place, which uh, is a much more um, conservative ideology as opposed to uh, liberalism. And instead of hegemony, you will have a balance of power. That's basically one empire dying and several others uh, rising. Right? Uh, well, it and... could be. Uh, but usually balance of power back in those days, it was largely militaristic. Uh, I think now it uh, manifests itself uh, in terms of political economy. So you, for example, see, uh, you know, you don't want to have too much dependence on one center of power, which is why many people are saying, oh, China, America's going down, you have China rising. But my, my point is you won't simply have China replacing America because uh, countries don't want another hegemon. So if you look at even Russia, which is China's best friend, uh, they don't want too much dependence on China either. They they recognize China as the most important partner now, but but they make sure to reach out to the Indians, you know, to the Koreans, uh, to Iran, to you know, ideally Europe, in order to avoid excessive dependence on a more powerful uh, state. Because then, once you have this asymmetrical interdependence, uh, you know, China will gain a lot of influence. So you see countries trying to. Um, to, the, to, to diversify their economic connectivity, to avoid this excessive dependence on any one pole of power. So, um, hmm. so yeah. my argument would be that America has the political power it has uh, for probably two reasons. Yeah, the financial power that they have, which they obtain through the military power they have. Yeah, they have about seven hundred fifty known military bases. Together, they have probably 900 military bases around the world. America is the most militarized society on this planet, not only now, but ever, right? I mean, the military spending is more than all other countries combined. Yeah. So from that, from that perspective, and again, uh, referring to uh, my conversation with some other people on, on, this, uh, on this channel, America shows all the classic hallmarks of an empire, right? And when empire of that size crumble, the world order changes and we are just, I believe, are in the beginning of the coming change. And as a result of which the decline of American power, you see over everywhere those those regional conflicts in the Middle East is just the most recent one. Right? Yeah. No, no, I, I, I agree. And I think that uh, what's been happening over the past, uh, especially two years now has intensify this uh, of course what the united states should have done after the cold war was to pull a bit back you know rebuild its strength uh, you know deal with social uh, inequalities and economic problems but instead they went full in and what usually happens with uh, imperial overstretch is you transfer resources from the core to the periphery to run your empire now look at the united states today they have huge social problems in the country a cultural war i would say uh, the economics are terrible the, the, the debt is unsustainable they're in difficult positions position now where you know they have to sacrifice their economy or their currency because uh, there's no way to address the inflation uh, politically they have now two camps who hate each other you can't really have peaceful transfer of power either because both sides are arguing that the other side is a threat to national security that they're all traitors so trying to destroy uh, what's most sacred to them you know their country uh, and uh, as all of this is happening of course uh, its influence abroad is also uh, disappearing. Uh, that's why people are now arguing, you know, if we lose now in Ukraine, well, what will that mean for NATO? But forget about Ukraine. What about the, the Middle East? Uh, uh, the whole idea that the US should lecture the world about human rights after, you know, uh, working with Israel to commit this massacre, it seems almost like a joke now. And uh, so across the Middle East, look at all the attacks now on American occupation forces in Syria and Iraq. They're intensifying. Uh, now you have Yemen attacking uh, American warships in, in the Red Sea. Yeah. So, so there's um, yeah. 
the deterrent is is uh, slipping, and uh, more countries are now uh, opposing it. So they're opposing America militarily, economically, politically, and all of this is happening at a time when you see the United States internally is fragmenting as well. Because you know, a very old lesson is you can't really be an empire and be a democracy as well. Uh, something's going to crack, and uh, I think uh, a lot of things are cracking at the same time now. Yeah, that's why you see the militarization of the police in America, not only in America, also also in, in all other Western countries, right? To keep the populations under control. Yeah, it's a bit frightening, to be honest, because uh, yeah. there's a stability there. Well, that's a common, whoever, or most authors on civilizations kind of point this out as well, that when when empires collapse and civilization begin to crack, uh, uh, well, what's often taken by surprise is uh, the sense of stability, which was there. And when they just realized it was all based on built on eggshells, like how how, how fragile things can be. Uh, look at the you know or, or, what what holds the West together. What defines the collective West? You know, as being political liberalism, you know, tolerance. Uh, look look what's happened now. We, you know, France they're banning uh, protests uh, who are criticizing the massacre of children <laughs> in Gaza. Uh, censorship is now the new norm. You know. This wasn't that long ago. We all agreed censorship's a bad thing. Now, if you criticize censorship, it means that you're trying to accommodate uh, Russian propaganda. It's uh, it's it's uh, just one after the other. We appear to abandon very important norms, which we should have, hopefully, you know, had its own foundation. So, it's um, no, it's uh, it's not going anywhere good. I think. Hmm. If you come back to Russia, in particular to Putin, yeah, he's uh, often described as the madman, right? Crazy Putin, uh, unprovoked, does irrational things. If you really read the literature, there emerges a different picture. Yeah, what's your point of view on uh, on Putin? No, I I agree. I think he's uh, he's been a he's he's quite rational. Uh, he's uh, somewhat constrained. Uh, keep in mind that in 2014, after you know the West toppled uh, um, Yanukovych in Ukraine, uh, you know he he, he was for uh, he accepted taking Crimea, but he was very hesitant to to back any secession of Donbas. Uh, very vocal about it. Uh, the main pressure from him came from the more hawks who were saying, "Listen, the West will not want any peace with us. They're preparing for conflict." Uh, this is the time to take Donbass. Uh, and he said, no, 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 we're not going to do this. I mean, this is not a popular view, but uh, uh, he, he's often been seen as one of the more moderate ones, uh, which has been maybe too pro-Western, which has been too weak, according to his main opposition. I think often in the West, we have this assumption that the main opposition in Russia is some liberal offspring of the Yeltsin era. But, uh, but you know, he, he was the successor of Yeltsin. He was handpicked by Yeltsin. This is... Uh, this was someone who was supposed to redefine what being pro-Western meant, uh, and uh, you know this. No, I, I think that uh, he's, he's quite rational, but uh, I think the reason why maybe we hate him so much is the same reason why he's so popular in Russia. Because when he came in at the end of the nineties, uh, Russia was getting weaker by the day. The uh, country was pretty much owned by the oligarchs, which were being accommodated in London and the United States. It looked like the country was heading for you know the same fate as the Soviet Union and uh, uh, look at the country today is uh, reversed it completely uh, you know the society is thriving a huge middle class uh, you know 99 we're bombing their key allies uh, you know the Serbs today uh, you know we're throwing everything we have at the Russians and still we can't defeat them uh, the economy is solid uh, it's um, you know he's, he's, he's done He's done well for Russia. Doesn't mean that uh, I have to agree with everything he said, but the way he's portrayed in the media here, it's uh, quite absurd. He's, you know, always portrayed as the new Hitler. It's, uh, it's not a very reasonable assessment. Saddam Hussein was the new Hitler. Gaddafi was a Hitler. You know, whenever, whenever it's suitable, this this kind of uh, yeah made up. Yeah. Well, this is a sad way of portraying international politics. You know, it's yeah. uh, how you would explain it to a. Fanatic or a child uh, is, you know, oh, the reason why we have conflict with, uh, you know, uh, any of these countries uh, is because, you know, the leader is very bad. You know, if we can just topple the government or kill him, then everything would be fine. I mean, we we do this with every with everything. We never talk about uh, the comp competing national interests. So, uh, you know, we, we always have to go after, or always after leadership. Be it, you know, Iraq, Libya, Russia, China. 
even allies with Turkey when we're now having some tensions with the Turks. Oh, if we just can get rid of Erdogan. Yeah. But the people like Erdogan there. They have support him. So we, it doesn't mean we have to like him, but we have to look at the national interests and the way uh, Turkey is positioning itself to understand why they support him. And it's the same with Russia. Mm. Uh, again, if, if the country, we thought the country might be collapsing when Putin took over. And now 20 plus years later, uh, Russia is, uh, again, a superpower. Uh, you know, the, the poverty rates, have, uh, everything has been turned around. We, we can't say anything positive. It's very strange because, uh, again, uh, in this country, if you say something positive, like what is done right, uh, you know, they start to question your loyalty. Say, hey, are you, you know, are you in bed with the enemy? Uh, who are you cheering for? You know, they just want to make sure you're in the right trenches. Are you with us or them? If you're with us, then you have to repeat these same slogans over and over again. Uh, but again, this is... Uh... Yeah. The one thing that uh, struck me when, you know, when sanctions were um, put on, on Russia and the expectations within a week, the economy will crumble. I'm not an economist, but I knew that Russia has no debt. Yeah. So if, if Russia would have been indebted or enslaved, like many other countries that may have worked. Yeah. But I would expect governmental officials, policymakers be aware of these kind of, of facts. So being not only having no debts, but having uh, amassed gold reserves that out that outperform American gold reserves over time, right? I mean, someone would have have to have the, the, the knowledge or, or, I don't know, lucidity to see that this cannot work no i think that they were very systematically uh, paying down all their debts uh, building up huge foreign reserves uh, the russians accruing huge amount of golds uh, gold uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah diversifying their supply chains all of this they were already doing well before 2014 but again uh, what happened in 2014 really shook the russians because uh, you know, we often think when the Russians took Crimea, this was a huge betrayal by the Russians, but they saw this as a huge betrayal by us. And I don't think people appreciate the huge shift that occurred in Russia then, because after 2014, they really start to intensify uh, the diversification away from the West, because uh, they no longer saw uh, uh, a future with the West, because, you know, ever since Gorbachev's uh, dreams of this common European home, they, they thought that they would build an inclusive Europe, uh, you know, uh, when, which Russia would have a seat at the table. But uh, but what happened in 2014 was very dramatic because we very clear, clearly then showed that we would not accept that Ukraine would be a bridge between the West and Russia. It would have to choose. You know, have to make the right choice because initially they chose Russia before we toppled the government. So, so once we toppled the government to make it a, a front line against Russia and then began to militarize it, uh, you know, they saw what was happening. So since 2014, they intensified this process. They tried to make their uh, economy bulletproof for sanctions, uh, which meant uh, become less reliant on technologies, currencies, payment systems, uh, everything. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it turned out when we put all the sanctions on, on their energy, uh, the Russians were able to diversify their economic connectivity to the East, while the Europeans did not have the same opportunity. We became more dependent on the United States, and uh, and uh, it's a different story. Yeah. So I, I heard that Russia put a fifty-year contract together with China in in regards to gas, right? Fifty years. That's coming back to what you said. You cannot just reverse this in a you know we end the war and everything goes back to to, to like it was. That that's not going to happen, right? At the same time, we Europeans are are now dependent on this uh, fracking gas. This dirty much more expensive fracking gas which is going to be shipped over the ocean with the with the under high pressure these kind of things and yeah, look when the gas pipeline was built with uh, china when they signed all the contracts or immediately after we toppled the government in ukraine the power of siberia pipeline was agreed with the chinese i'm sure the russians made some concessions in order to get this up and running as quick as possible what was the reason for this they they, they saw where this was heading so so this is um yeah, but you see the same with India. Before 2022, they hardly had any energy or oil, sorry, oil exports to India. Now they became the largest supplier. I mean, this is uh, this is a huge shift, uh, and uh, 
And uh, I think overall in the, you know, the big picture, I think uh, the Americans focus so much on preventing the Russians and Germans from coming together. Uh, you know, this industrial giant of Germany that we, you know, we, we wanted to push the Russians away, but then we pushed them right over to China instead, which is, uh, you know, Germany on steroids, a much, much larger power. And so now Germany, which is an actual ally, is uh, severely weakened, dragging the Europeans with them. Meanwhile, all these resources from Russia are fueling the further rise of China, which is an actual rival to the United States. So, uh, so we haven't played this well at all <laughs> in any way. No, and Germany... And Germany will not forget that America bombed their, their critical infrastructure. Yeah, I have spoken to some militaries there. They, they first of all, they know, and they will not forget. Yeah, that there will come long. There are long-term consequences uh, connected, and not only from Germany, not because other governments like yours, they also know who they did. Yeah. There is no question about. It. No, so you know, people like Schultz and Baerbock, and you know, they will. Uh, uh... I don't know. They won't be there. They will fade into history. They will yeah. fade into history. Well, yes. well, they're not able to to deliver on what, what's the national interest. So, mm. so if if you can't, you know, ideology only takes you so far. If if they're not able to uh, to, to to continue essentially serving German interest, mm. uh, you know, the popularity is disappearing, which it is, and then eventually mm. they will be removed from power. Uh, you know, they can try to resist it in uh, different ways, but at the end of the day, they will. Be removed, and likely who will take over would be someone who is able to to rebuild some German strength, and that means re adjusting to realities, which is uh, uh, yeah, that uh, only connecting to the United States in terms of economic dependence is not going to bring them any prosperity. And mm -hmm. as you said, I think there's also some resentment because uh, you know the, the Germans built up this in, uh, in uh, energy infrastructure. For so many years now, in order to make sure that they would remain an industrial powerhouse, and yeah. the Americans came and clipped it all away, and uh, yeah. even celebrated in front of them, saying how wonderful this was and uh, opportunity, yes, opportunity, so humiliation and destruction yeah. of their yeah. economy. There will come a day now when when this will have a consequence, but not yet, because uh, yeah. Schultz again he has invested everything in his political career into this uh, project, so yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. He will go kicking and, and from screaming four, history. From those four pipelines, three were bombed. One is still intact, probably by accident, right? But Germany refuses to take any gas from Russia so far uh, through this one pipeline. Yeah, they should at least start to keep the options open because mm. uh, yeah. if they don't uh, go and start to repair, make some rep repairs, and uh, you know, there's going to be uh, the pipelines will will be uh, damaged if they stay open for too long and then they will be it's beyond repair. So it's, uh, yeah. and Russia kind of lost its interest. It's not going to do this again. When they, when they decided to build the pipelines with Germany, they were told yeah. it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be used as, an, uh, as a political weapon. And instead, yeah. uh, you know, they asked for the pipeline and then they've been uh, kicking and screaming and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, creating conditions and threats ever, you know, through the whole uh, production of the pipeline yeah. and then destroying it when it was finished. So, so I think, um, no, I think the Germans have reasons to be yeah. resentful and uh, I'm guessing they will vote accordingly. It's also a dangerous strategy, right? I mean, if you sit in a glass house, you shouldn't just throw with stones. Yeah. Guess what else is down there on the bottom of the sea unprotected for thousands of kilometers. Yeah. The lifeblood of our Western society, right? Information highways, yeah. right? Cables, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I would like to, if, yeah. with your permission, I would like to spend a couple of, of minutes on the Middle East. Yeah. yeah. I don't know in, in as much as you can comment on that. But first of all, are there any interests? Because I read a couple of things. Yeah. Are there any interests of Russia and Putin concerning? the conflict that's happening right now in the Middle East? Well, some of it's opportunity, of course, because, uh, you know, Israel will have a higher priority than Ukraine for the Americans. So, so just that... This, of course, there's the oil. Yeah, so, there's no oil in Ukraine, yeah. but there's a lot of oil in... <laughs> but so, um, so of course, Russia's ramping up its pressure all across the front line as a response to this in Ukraine. But, but it's beyond that. I think, uh, um, you know, people often focus on Kissinger that he was able to push you know, cause a division between the russians and the chinese but you know he also was able to assist in getting the russians kicked out of the middle east especially from egypt but uh, russia's coming back in a big way so and and it's doing it with with the chinese as well so they're seeking they're working very hard to form close relations with uh, iran saudi arabia and other gulf states so uh, 
so this is uh, keep in mind uh, since the, the the Russians invaded last year, uh, Putin only really went to to China, uh, but now of course he went to Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and. Uh, I think many in the West were surprised by the welcome he got in both those countries. But uh, again, they're they're very much welcomed, uh, the Russians, as well as the Chinese. Uh, it doesn't mean they want to join an anti-Western alliance or anything. It just means they want to diversify. Um, and uh, so, so at the moment, I think they're going to be pulled in. You will see more, not just with the Chinese, but also with the Russians and the Middle East. They will have more partnerships for you know technological development, uh, common industries you will see more of these uh, transportation corridors coming into place you'll have uh, uh, yeah, the more working on the common banks uh, trading more in their own currencies uh, becoming less reliant on western uh, insurances so I think it's um, uh, all of these new economic connectivities are also translating into political opportunities because uh, keep in mind when the Americans were dominating the Middle East uh, you know they, they know what they're doing they like all empires, you have divide and conquer. You have they have an interest in putting you know, push, pushing the Arabs against the Iranians, because uh, uh, well, then you make the Arabs dependent on America and you weaken the Iranians. And you know America rules. But when the Chinese came in, uh, as well as the Russians, they're doing something different. They they're not looking to develop uh, peacetime alliances uh, because this is not an economically good idea. Because then you end up a uh, uh, not isolating, but uh, alienating the other side. So uh, the Chinese and Russians are doing the exact opposite. When they go to Iran, for example, and want to have closer economic deals, they also go to Saudi Arabia. So they don't pick one over the other, which is why after you know Putin went to Saudi Arabia, he also invited you know the Iranian presidents to come to Moscow and and sign agreements. So so they're very careful. Uh, and this is why the Chinese were able to, you know, fly in and negotiate this uh, peace now between the Saudis and the Iranians. And this is something very yeah. different. And uh, uh, and this is something also they're, they're building on. The Iranians and uh, Saudis really trying to normalize relations because none of them want to be used by foreign powers. Doesn't mean they don't have problems, but, uh, you know, they... Uh, um, they they still have to live in that neighborhood. They will still be neighbors. So So they... So this new economic diversification, it, it allows them to choose different political paths as well. So I think that, uh, again, all of this was happening before the 7th of October. But uh, I think a lot of it will intensify more now because what, what Israel, the way it responded now, has, uh, again, it's, it's shook the whole region very much. It galvanized, I believe, something around the globe that was not there before, right? I, I just returned from Amman. Yeah? I spent uh, some time there to talk to people and to interview some people. Um, what I'm what I'm hearing is that they kind of you know incentivize the whole new generation to be interested in that conflict, right? Yeah, and I think probably that was part of the Hamas <laughs> objective as well, because uh, when when they mm. suffer in silence and just uh, you know go on with the apartheid system in the West Bank or mm. the well call it imprisonment of Gaza, uh, the the world kind of forgets about it. But uh, but the way the Israelis reacted to this, of course, uh, a whole new sense of uh, uh, empathy has come for the Palestinian cause. And uh, so I think a whole generation of people now have been uh, politically become politically uh, engaged or interested now or become uh, politically supportive of Palestine. So, um, no, I think... Uh, how's the, situ how's how's the situation in Norway in, in, in this respect? How's the situation in Norway? I mean, what's the sentiment in Norway from the general population? What's the sentiment or the, the policies uh, from the government? concerning Palestine? Well, the, the population is, I think, a, a huge majority is very sympathetic to the Palestinians. Uh, I was actually in Oslo now uh, on the weekend and they had a huge demonstration with just thousands and thousands walking around waving Palestinian flags. So I think the sympathy is there. Uh, also the government, for that sake, I mean, they, they're still uh, cautious uh, given that, you know, they want to maintain not annoy the Americans too much, but but compared to other Europeans, the the G Germans, for example, or the French, uh, the the government is, uh, I think, much more uh, sympathetic towards the Palestinian cause than more vocal about it, at least than uh, a lot of its other the other Europeans. 
uh, which is interesting because on, on Ukraine, where we are, I would put us in the category of the more one of the more hawkish countries. Uh, uh, but with uh, yeah, because you have a border, you have a border with Russia, of course. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure why, why why we're so hawkish in terms of sending weapon mm-hmm. and the rhetoric and it's uh, you know mm-hmm. no no negotiations. Just uh, I don't know why, but when when it comes to the Palestinians, uh, you you see much more empathy uh, from the Norwegian government as well. Okay, one one last round up question, if if I may, yeah. I would be interested. You wrote a couple of, of again. I said it already. Quite a number of books, actually, more than more than just a couple. And I know that you have been heavily criticized. So, what what are the topics that you are most heavily criticized in in lack of another word, right? Uh, for yeah, well, it depends what you mean heavily criticized. It's uh, it's uh, like it's a group of uh, of uh, they call them some humanitarian activists and. Uh, uh, who, who have written, but it's 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 the same ones and they use the same tactics. For example, it was called by the national media, uh, one of the main channels. And afterwards, you know, we they dis, we, they, they, they talk to me, we discuss, they have a chance to challenge what I say, uh, you know. And, but when it's done, then they're shamed. Like, how did you know he used to, you know, publish in RT, you know? And then suddenly they have to apologize. So, so I don't think it's massively that that controversial. I think they it's it's made out to be that way. Uh, but uh, usually from other academics, I get a lot of emails uh, of support. Uh, um, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a cancellation culture. So you have a very vocal minority who's trying to dictate for the rest. Uh, but my my topics were, uh, well, many. I, uh, I, I first looked at uh, uh, European and Russian security. Uh, and then I uh, have written also books and uh, a lot of articles on Russian conservatism uh, and uh, uh, also um, yeah, geoeconomic regionalism. So how uh, Russia is trying to build new uh, geoeconomic regions. Uh, yeah, what else? Uh, I've written on uh, the use of political propaganda. So more specifically, uh, Russophobia, how, uh, how the anti-Russian propaganda is, is built up by by looking at the all the signs of, of propaganda. I, I would love to talk about the topic of propaganda because I have other discussions in regards to propaganda, this time uh, in regards to Israel. But I'm also I'm a, an academically trained behavior analyst. I'm really interested in propaganda. So what, what can you tell us about Russian propaganda or anti-Russian propaganda, actually? Yeah. Well, the reason I wanted to look at anti-Russian propaganda is because... Uh, during uh, during the Cold War, we like we during Cold War, the best propaganda came from the West because uh, you need source credibility with propaganda. And when I also was noticing how everyone now condemns RT as propaganda, but it's very poor propaganda because everyone knows it's state funded, it's presenting from a Russian perspective. So if you want to be convincing, uh, you need to have source credibility. You have to build up what seems like to be neutral. Uh, People. So, so through the Cold War, for example, the British and American were able to uh, to use uh, private industries, private media uh, as a way to launder a lot of their propaganda, which made it more effective. So, anyways, because of this, I was a bit curious because if you look at Russia propaganda, if you do a search in any journals, everything is about the Russians' propaganda, and they do have their own propaganda, but n- there's never any of ours, uh, which is kind of strange because we have propaganda, and so I, I defined uh, propaganda then as being a way of using. Uh, of a convincing an audience without appealing to reason because propaganda simply not, it's not just lying. It's uh, often appealing to the unconscious uh, because uh, human beings, we, we think we're often very rational, but we also, uh, a lot is based on uh, instincts and impulses. And uh, one key of them would be we organize in groups and we always divide into us and them as, uh, as, as groups. So, uh, so, so, well, what what we often see propaganda being is we are uh, manipulating um, the heuristics or the the lenses of how we interpret the world, because what Walter Lippmann and uh, others wrote a, a bit over a century ago is, you know, as the world become more and more complex, uh, how how are we going to have opinions? Uh, how are we going to know what's happening in Iran, you know, in Venezuela, Russia, China, in Germany? It's very hard to. You know, how are people going to make sense of all of this? And the reason is we, we equip people with a lens, a way of interpreting the world. And uh, 
and uh, the the main propaganda we use is just everything is about democracy versus authoritarianism, which is very appealing because no matter what happens in the world, if you have a let's say if Russia invades a country, well, it's it's because it wants to build an empire. It hates democracy. But if we invade a country, well, we want to help human rights and build democracy. So we might do the wrong thing, but we do it for the right reasons. So this is often how how it works. You create a favorable framing of a, of any conflict, and uh, and uh, again, I, th- I thought Russian prop- the anti-Russian propaganda was interesting because if you want to divide, construct these groups like the identity, who are we and who are them, Russia's always been created as our opposite. You know, they were uh, the East to our West in Europe. You know, we were the Europeans. They were the Asians from the you know who, descendants of the Mongols. You know. Uh, during the Cold War. Uh, well, it was always very racial. If you follow the rhetoric of the past hundred years, it was always very ethnic. So, you know, we're, we're civilized Europeans, they're barbaric Asians. And then around the Cold War, it began to be translated more into ideology. You know, it has to be contrasted, but then it felt more natural. So we're capitalists, they're communists, we're Christians, they're atheists. And, uh, and then after the Cold War, I saw this being recreated again, because once we decided we're not going to have a common Europe, we also have to explain why we're good and they're bad or why we're civilized they're barbarians uh why we are you know modern they're backwards and then we again we reinvent this uh everything has to be interpreted through liberal democracy versus authoritarianism and this is largely how uh, it was built and uh, i think my, my my main criticism of it or warning is wasn't really original from me i stole it from walter Lippmann because you know he was writing on the uh, on the on the on the Russian Civil War, uh, and back then in was it yeah in 1917 he was to 1919 he was writing, and he was pointing out that well the British propaganda was quite effective and he was quite supportive initially of propaganda because he said the the benefit was you know everything was portrayed as being good versus evil you know the developed versus the barbaric and he said this is a good way to mobilize people. You know, this is what the Americans did in the First World War as well, where Lippmann worked, by the way. And he was able to say, uh, you know, this is a struggle, you know, good versus evil, good us versus the evil Germans. And once you do this, it's easy to mobilize people because, uh, you know, you always fight versus evil. He said that the main problem was once you have a workable solution, a peace settlement, for example, uh, people will not want it because, uh, uh, because uh, you know, well, why would you make peace with evil. That's appeasement. And he said that this was the problem at the end of the the Russian Civil War, because they said all along, oh, the Bolsheviks are losing. The Polish are beating them here and there. Uh, they're hopeless. They're backwards. They're going to be defeated. And they're pure evil. And then suddenly, you know, of course, it was lies. And then the Bolsheviks are winning. And then he was pointing out, well, how uh, once they were winning, they had to set up diplomatic relations with them. It became very difficult for the British to do so. And again, this seems very much like what we're doing today. And it was the same with the Germans. You know, they were pure evil. You know, it was the end to a war to end all wars. And once, uh, you know, so once a peace settlement was possible, they, they didn't take it. Instead, they went for the full destruction of Germany. And once they were defeated, they had to have a humiliating peace. And this laid the foundation for another world war. So so this was <laughs> the dangers of propaganda. And um uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, you're probably familiar with Edward Bernays. Uh, this is the, Sigmund Freud's nephew. Yeah, yeah this yeah. nephew of Sigmund Freud. And this is how yeah. I think I would f- describe propaganda, which would be the marketing of politics. Because uh, marketing is, uh, again, you, you, you sell ideas instead of, uh, you know, when you buy a car, you don't yeah. buy transportation, you buy, you know, status symbol, you know, you buy sex, you buy yeah. whatever. And this is what he did with politics. You know, when er- Edward Bernays wanted to, convince people to smoke cigarettes you know he called them for for women i mean he called them uh, torches of freedom torches of yeah freedom. so so, so yeah. you sell it not as a you know as a smoke but it represents uh, empowerment mm-hmm. of women this is what it is and uh, he used the same ideas for you know toppling the government in guatemala he just say hey listen this is about freedom you know freedom prevailing over communism it had nothing to do with that and uh, you know every historian agree with this but uh, it's how you market it and this is the marketing of politics as well this is why Whenever you have a conflict, what's the first thing the Americans and NATO politicians will say? Oh, this is uh, freedom, uh, democracy, and uh, versus uh, you know this uh, this evil intention. Evil. So yeah, axis of evil. Yeah, 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 which is great for mobilizing the public because uh, yeah, and and it works. Think when Russia invaded Ukraine, no one even knew where it was on the map in America at least, and still everyone had the strongest yeah. 
conviction. Everyone knew exactly what this was about. This was, uh, they just wanted freedom and peace and democracy. And then the Russians came and took it away because they just wanted to build their empire, restore the Soviet Union. So again, it's this, mm. uh, this always the same marketing, the same slogans, the same emotional appeal. So it's, uh, it's quite effective. But um, uh, I published that book, by the way, it came out two months before Russia invaded. So I would probably <laughs> had a lot more material if I would have waited uh, six months. So. But I've tried to follow it because through the, guess at least since the beginning of the 1800s, the, the anti-Russian propaganda, especially after uh, defeating uh, Napoleon, the British went very hard on it. And there's, they followed the yeah. same kind of recipe all, all along. So it was quite interesting to kind of follow the, the development and uh, how how identities are built because for example when in the uh, crimean war in 1953 you know that the turks were always resented and they suddenly shifted because in every story you need the damsel in distress you know like oh the innocent turks yeah. usually turks were presented as horrible because they were bad to the greeks but suddenly greeks the, Tur the turks were so innocent then you had the evil russians and then the British savior would come and rescue the Turks from the evil. So, you know, these uh, political identities were constructed uh, very much almost overnight in order to, to frame this. And a lot of G British were at the time uh, researching this, like, because uh, it took people a bit by surprise, like, what, what, where did this narrative come from? So, so it's, it's quite interesting that uh, you see a yeah, common uh, path over the past uh, at least 200 uh, years. Mm. On that note, Professor Glenn Deason, I really thank you for your time. It was an illuminating conversation. I wish we could uh, we could prolong, <laughs> and I cannot promise that I will not contact you again. Okay, but for today, again, thank you very much for your time. Most appreciated. Yes, my pleasure. Anytime. <laughs>